we have the reads that we made last week. So these are my two that we made last week. Uh, this is the Chris Lieb cane. And this is the Morelli Lavoro cane. And then I have three other ones that I made um, after we finished our class. You can follow along with the directions um, also at bassoonwithaview.com. And then if you click on the how I make reads, two wire reads method, you'll see two posts there. If you click on the second one, that is what we're doing today. So we are going to finish this, these reads. Um, but first we're going to do, we are not going to wrap reads today because I don't want to, it's going to take a lot of time. I don't want to do that. really want to focus on finishing. So we are going to pull out, you guys, over in the snow building, have heat shriek tubing, which is really fun and super easy to use. I used to use this stuff for years. And this size is uh, 5 sixteenths. And you can get it a little bit bigger. This will fit like just perfectly on the on it. And you can get different colors. But it's really easy to use. I do not have a strong opinion about nylon thread, cotton thread, nail polish, hot glue. I really do not notice a difference. So this is just another option. And this is what we're going to use today. This is what you guys have over in the snow building. Before we do that, though, we need to snug up our wires. So um, grab a forming mandrel like this. And I'm going to use this one right here. But a forming mandrel is fine. And we just want to make sure that our wires are nice and snug. So you can see there's a little bit of play in my wire there. And we don't want it. We don't want that. We want it to be really, really snug. So using your pliers, remember when we tighten wires, we're going to pull and then twist, pull and then twist, okay? We want the wires to be really snug, but we don't wanna see the cane collapsing. If the cane starts to collapse at the point of the wire, then we know we've gone much too tight with that wire, okay? So just snug them up so that there's no play. You can see this one right here. This has got a little bit of play in it. So I'm going to eliminate that. Okay, so pull and then twist. And now I've gotten rid of it. And so that's, that's perfect, okay? So let's do that to, if hopefully everyone has uh, two that you made last week. I'm going to do the same thing again. Pull and twist. Pull and twist. Whoops. And make sure that top wire is sitting right as close to the collar as possible. I'm going to do one more because I made an error last week and nobody caught it. Um, when we did the second piece, the second read, in the demonstration, I didn't tell anyone to cut the tube to 27 millimeters and no one, no one caught it. So one of your tubes is longer than your other tube. Let me just do one more. Okay, so we're gonna work with these three. Okay, now, You've got your wires tightened and you might want to trim them down a little shorter. And we're going to go ahead. I fold my bottom wire up. This is just a me thing. A lot of people fold them down and my top wire down. So go ahead and do that with all of your reads trim up the wire if you need to bottom wire up or down and then top wire down Okay. 
All right, so now I'm gonna pull out my heat shrink. And you can make this as long as you want. You know, part of the reason that we do a wrap or hot glue, do go cement, all of these things is to help with sealing around the tube. So you can make this as long or as short as you want. Um, you can make it long enough to just sit to where a traditional wrap would go. You can make it longer than that. It really doesn't matter. So I'm just going to cut mine. Like that. And then we'll open it up. Slide it onto your reed. And I'm just going to line it up with the bottom of my reed like that. And then we get to have some fun. So you're going to grab your lighter. Um, hey, Tim, Nisea, and Riley, did you guys get all the tools out of the reed room? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so there's a lighter in that little box. And we're going to just heat this up. Now we're heating it up. Don't, don't let the flame touch the heat shrink tubing. Okay, we're just going to heat it up. So just let it hover over that. And it'll, you'll see, it'll just collapse in on the reed. And go all the way around. And that's so that. That's it. With this method, you yes. can't put on bees. <laughs> no, you can. You could do go. You could do go bees right on there. It might even stay on there better, Tara. Mm. It might stay on there better. Okay. So that's heat shrink tubing. It's super fast and super easy. So I'm going to do that two more times with my other pieces. Hello, Annie. Hello, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Always a pleasure. <laughs> All right, and so just repeat the same thing. Pop it on there. Get it lined up with the bottom of the reed. And then just heat it up over the flame. Don't let the flame touch it because it will burn. We just need to heat it. Very easy, very fast. Again, you can buy these in different colors from Amazon. Forest also sells it. So it can be it can be pretty fun. I just got this at Harbor Freight for a few dollars and I got eight feet of it. What sizing of heat shrink did you say that was again? This is five sixteenths. And there's one more size that's a little bit bigger. Either one will work. But the five sixteenths is like really the perfect size. Okay. So we've got that. We have that wrapped, except not wrapped, it's shrunk. Okay. How are we all doing? Good, makes sense. Riley and Nisea and Tim, how's it looking on your end? It's good, I think. It's good. Okay, are we ready to move on to finishing? All right. Okay, so the next thing I would love to do is to ream out these reeds while they're dry. And the reamer I'm going to use, this is the Andante and Rondo reamer. It really doesn't matter what one you use. Ideally, your room, your reamer will be well matched to your bocal. 
I don't think that mine is well matched to my bulk goal, but I'm not worried about it. I've just never, like they say you should have like, like if you have a heck of vocal, you should use a Rieger reamer just so that the taper matches the vocal. I've never done that ever in my career and I've been fine. So, um, so this is an Andante Rondo and this one's nice because it has this adjustable stopper so you can figure exactly how far you wanna go so it fits on your vocal. And that's a really nice detail. So, and this is a nice one. You can use this one wet or dry. Um, I ream my reeds sometimes wet, but it is definitely better if you can ream with the, the cane totally dry. That's the cleanest way to do it. So let's go ahead and ream. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And then once they're reamed, we are ready to clip the tip. So this is very interesting because in this wire or in this read method, my wire is right on the collar. And a lot of people depending, depending on their style of reed making measure where they cut the tip sometimes from the top wire and sometimes from the collar i typically have always measured from the top wire i'm going to be measuring from the middle of my wire in this method though and i already know um, i'm going to cut mine at 28 millimeters but the length at which you cut your blade of course is what determines the overall pitch of the reed and one of the many things I love about this method is that I always found that with a three wire reed, if I wanted to clip the tip again to adjust for pitch, it was almost impossible. Like it always kind of destroyed the reed because then you'd had to refinish the tip and it just was always so nuanced and stylized. It, it seemed like I could never quite recapture the magic if I had to reclip the tip. But in this style, it finishes so easily that if you clip the tip at 28 and then you're like, ah, that's too long. I need to take some more off. It does not seem to destroy the reed as it did, in my opinion, with the three wire reed system. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going, um, I've got my guillotine right here. And again, I'm going to be measuring from the middle of the top wire. That's going to be my point for length. And I actually have to do two cuts to do this. And so I'm cutting at 28 because I already know that's the proper length. And so you might want to go 28 and then if you need to go shorter, it's really easy to clip the tip in this style. It's not going to destroy the reed if you need to go back and uh, make the blade shorter. What was the length you gave again? 28 millimeters measured okay. from the middle of the top wire. Now I'm going to um, point. Okay. So this is the Chris lead. This is the shape that I know I love with my instrument. And then this is um, some Morelli Lavoro that I got from Barton Kane factory seconds. And last week, you guys might remember that I said I ended up doing a secondary bevel because I've already processed some of this cane and the aperture when I cut the tip, it was totally closed. It was completely closed. And so now this has this has the secondary bevel and you can see the aperture is more open. Ooh, that is see if it'll focus in, but you can see it's still it's not hugely open. So I think this is a unique feature of this Morelli Lavoro cane as compared to like, look at the Chris Lieb aperture. Look at that, really different. And then this is another piece from the Barton Kane factory seconds. I have no idea what the shape is. So here's the three. 
and also the Chris Lieb. And the, this is cane that I have shaped, profiled, and gouged myself. And there's nice, really good balance at the aperture as well. It's opening up really nicely balanced. So that's great. Okay. Now we're ready to do this. So I'm going to actually start with the Chris Lee because I know that came the best. Okay. So this is when we need our pencil. How are we doing in the snow building? Am I going too fast? Are you guys okay? Tim, we're, Riley? We're, we're getting there. We're, we're, we're okay. We'll, we'll be all right. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. So here we go. We are going to subdivide this blade into a few different ways. So the first thing we're going to do and go, you can go ahead and measure your blade so you can make this perfect. So my blade is actually coming in just about 25. Okay. So we're going to subdivide this blade into three equal sections like this. I'm kind of eyeing this and that's fine too, but you can measure and make it perfect. Okay. And we're going to call these zone one, two, and three. Once we've done that, we are then going to subdivide zone one into in half like this. And then we're gonna create something um, we call the anchor shape. We're gonna draw a little anchor and it's gonna come down and then back up and out like this. And really you can stop, you don't need to go all the way out to the corners. You can just stop right here. So we get something that looks like that. Let me show that again. I'm going to flip it over and do the same thing. So first, we're going to subdivide into three equal zones. One, two, three. Then we're going to subdivide the top zone in half. And then we're going to create an anchor. We're going to start in the very middle, right there. We're going to come down about halfway, halfway, um, halfway across the width. And then come back up to that middle section. And so it looks like a little anchor. And this is going to help us do the hand profiling. And what we're creating is um, a hand profile imitation of the Andante Rondo tip profile. That's what that looks like. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and we're going to throw this into water. None of this stuff has to soak for very long. Every part of this process, when we're forming the tube, finishing the reed, and then even just soaking to play on the reed, it requires far less water, which is pretty substantial to say because I live in a very dry environment, but it really just requires a lot less wire. Mr. Okay. Crawford, did you make your reed dry? Did I ream the reed dry? Yes. Clip, the ring, clip it dry. I did clip it dry. <gasps> Does that feel controversial to you? Everything, yes. Like I'm <laughs> water right now so that I can clip it's my reed. Prob it's probably better to clip your tip when the reed is wet, but I've done it so many times when it's been dry and it's fine. It I've never had cane suddenly explode because I clipped the tip dry. Okay. I see your head's exploding, but it's gonna be fine. <laughs> okay. okay. I do go, it's fine. I had some pre All stuff. All right. Oh, good. Okay. So now I'm going to crow this reed. And it's got like a little bit of a crow, but it's still pretty tight. We can hear, do we hear all three? No, we're only hearing two of the pitches. Okay. Um, so typically 
when we first finish reads, we tend to go straight at the very tip. But the first place that we're going to take cane in this method is going to be, let me use a different holding mandrel. There we go. Is going to be at this little point at the bottom of the anchor right here. And this is the first place that we're going to take cane. Okay. So it's basically in the channels behind the tip, lower than the heart. Think about your read anatomy. We're going to take it right here at the little points on the anchor. And this is the first place we're going to take cane. And I know this is going to feel like kind of crazy and nonsensical and what difference is that going to make? But trust me, it's going to make a big difference. Okay. So you can kind of see what that looks like right there. So I ended up taking cane from this whole area. Ms. Crawford, is that a there. kitchen ceramic knife? Yeah, great question, Michael. I should talk about this. I um, I was turned on to this by Justin Miller years and years ago. It's a Kyocera ceramic knife. It costs like 20 bucks on Amazon. I hate sharpening bassoon knives. You don't have to sharpen this. If it by chance like chips, you can just buy a new new one and it's it's very 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 sharp and so this is what i use for reed making because i don't like sharpening knives i feel like i never was very good at it and yeah so i love this so yeah it's a it's a pairing knife well, thank you <laughs> yeah okay so now same thing to the other side And I think I probably just did about 16 swipes. I'll flip it over and I'll count this time. Yeah, 16, that feels right. Okay. And so again, you can kind of see there as you look at it but I'll draw it. I ended up taking cane from this whole area. Now this is the really fun part because you're like, that's a really strange place to start taking cane. That's going to make no difference, <laughs> but you would be mistaken. So I'm going to crow this again. And there's the third crow. It's kind of crazy, actually. So we brought in the third crow. And typically, when we think about bringing in the third crow, we think about taking cane from the bottom third of the reed. But this this window here and this anchor, it brings in that third crow. And for me, that was like really profoundly new information when I learned this method. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so super, super thuddy, obviously. Now I've got my um, dial indicator here and I, I love using a dial indicator. Unfortunately, there's no great way to get this into the shot. So you'll just kind of have to trust me when I give you the measurements. I am in metric. Um, and so our profile at the university comes off Ooh, this profile is a little bit different. It's a little bit heavier. So my tip right now is at 50. And back at the collar, I'm at uh, 110. <clears throat> so actually the back is probably pretty perfect. I like my back to be about 120, but my tip is really heavy. These typically will finish between 15 and 20 in metric. Okay. So my next thing I'm going to do now then is I'm just going to do the entire blade. And I have a bigger file that I've been using in this method as well. Typically, you know, we use the whole rat tail series. And so this is the normal size. <clears throat> and this is the one I've been using and it's like, like gosh, it's so big but it actually has been working really, really well. 
So I'm just going to basically take off a bunch of cane. Working all the way from the back. I'm going to go right over my rails. I'm going to go over the spine and right off the tip. And I'm going to be do left side, right side, and then center. And of course, I kind of twist to go off the corners. That's really more force of habit. I know that I have a lot of cane I need to take off at the tip. So I'm doing a lot more pressure there. Flipping it over, doing the same thing. Left side. Right side. Let it come up the center. Lighter pressure on the center. Left side. I kind of twist as I go off right side come up to the center there's my aperture i'm going to check my measurements so my tip is down to 33 And the back is basically still at 110 because I basically use no pressure at the back at all. So I didn't take really any cane off the back. Okay. <laughs> I've got a lot more of the crow now. It's coming in really quickly. We haven't done much to this. Okay. So now I want to come back and I want to uh, rebuild that anchor shape. So I'm going to subdivide again. Now I don't normally do this now. I just know where I want to take cane, but so that everyone can understand where I'm taking cane. So subdivide into three and then into half and then draw that anchor in like that. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to take, um, is what we call little half moons and it's right here at the tip we're going to take some we're going to leave it heavy right in the center of the tip and we're going to take it from this area right here and they're kind of like little half moons that sit inside the anchor shape and we're going to avoid the very center of the reed I'm not taking a lot. I think I just did like five strokes. Okay, I shouldn't say five strokes. I should say like five passes. And then I'm going to come back down to that bottom point of the anchor. And I'm just going to blend in a little bit into that tip. Again, not a lot. Go right off the tip. So from the bottom of the anchor up through that channel, avoiding the heart, avoiding the very middle of the tip. And now 
with my file, I'm just gonna blend from the back to the tip. So left side, right side, I'm not gonna go up the center. Left side, right side, I'm not going to go up the center, but I'm letting it come all the way across the tip like that. Okay, so I'm just blending, blending, blending. Wow, I don't know how that crow sounds like over Zoom, but it sounds like a really happy crow to me, okay? I'm kind of massaging down the aperture. It's it's pretty open. I like a very, very open aperture, but I'm just massaging it down a little bit so we can get rid of that thuddiness. I'm gonna check my measurements. I'm now uh, about 28 at the tip. So I'm getting really close here. Oh, one side's a lot lighter. I'm at 19 on the other side. And the back, I'm still pretty much at, right at 110, which is good. I've got dynamics. I don't have my tuner on. I can tell it's pretty much in tune. I might be a little bit low on my open F, but that's okay because I know it'll harden up, you know, tomorrow. Um, but let me, so I'll, let me check the things I always check. So I always check my open F. And it's, it's, it's pretty low. So I know I've probably hit my limit at the front of the read. And then I always check my low D because that's like a super gnarly note, right? And I always check the low D very, very soft. That lets me know like what kind of response I have overall on the read. I might check my C sharp to see how stable it is. And that's perfectly in tune. So I'm, I'm guessing that the front of my read is probably basically where I want it for today. I know I have a bit more of cane that I can take off, but I'll probably just want to wait until I play it tomorrow when it hardens up a little bit. But basically that read is done. Like that's it. That read is exactly where I want it to be for the first day. And tomorrow it'll be a little bit harder. And probably all I'll do is just, I'll just start blending with um, sandpaper all the way from the back to the tip, but it's all there. I mean, it's got, it's got a nice, happy, sizzly, but nutty sound. It's in tune, it's stable. It clearly has a lot of power. I still have a lot of rails there. So I could take some of that down if I wanted to, as I get playing into it. But otherwise, I mean, that's, that's a good read. <laughs> that is that. What are your questions? It finishes really fast. And part of that, there's a few things that I believe about this. One is because we're not, we have one less wire and we've moved this top wire right up to the collar. We've reduced the amount of points that stop vibration. And we want a reed to vibrate. Fundamentally, that's how a reed works. It works because it vibrates. If we control the vibration too much, and that happens with all these different points of wires, plus the collar, plus right, all these things that stop or dead in vibration. That's when we have to spend so much time finishing a read and we have to get really stylized with each portion of the blade. And I really believe that part of the reason that this finishes so quickly is because we've just reduced the amounts of points that stop or control vibration. This is my working theory. My next work, uh, concept with this read is that um, I used to play with reeds that had tubes that were substantially longer than the blade. And in this style, I'm basically exactly 50-50 or one millimeter longer in the blade than I am in the tube, 
which also means more of the reed proportionally is vibrating, which means it is a more vibrant reed. And that's my second working theory with this with this style is that more of the reed is vibrating and therefore it is a more vibrant reed. And so it's really responsive and it finishes easier. Those are my two big thoughts, okay? All right, so now let's redo this entire process and I'm gonna just grab I think I'm going to grab, I don't know what this one is. This is from Factory Seconds from Bart and Kane. So I have no idea what the shape or the profile is on this, but I'm going to apply the exact same principles and we're going to see it finish. Okay. So first, let me just dump it in some water. How are we doing? What are your questions? Miss Crawford, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, so you say, um, I mean, obviously, this is a very quick process. I'm impressed. Uh, I mean, I'm just thinking of being a teacher on a Friday night, how many reads I could crank out with this process. Yeah. Um, how, how, what would you say is the success rate compared to whenever you did three wire reads? That's a great question. I definitely feel like um, it, it's a lot higher. So let's say in 10 reads with three wire, I had seven that worked out. I would say in 10 reads of two wire, all of them work out. Wow. I rarely have a piece that I that I don't finish and like, like rarely. Yeah, I mean, maybe nine, maybe I should say nine because there's invariably going to be one that doesn't work, but it feels like my accuracy and consistency is much higher in this style for me at least. And I've got, Michael, I've got two students, Tara and Riley. Riley, you don't see. They've been doing this. Tara's been doing this for as long as I have. I taught it to her as soon as I learned it. Tara, what do you think about consistency? So I was actually super untrustworthy of this new method here. And then when she finally had me do it for the first time, I played the read that I made. And I don't work with knives very often. Um, I do for this method, but I hadn't before. And even having never worked with knives, it was the best read I ever made comparatively and so i think it's it's i very rarely throw away a read and if i throw away a read it's human error like it's because i did something wrong wow yeah that's a good point that's that's what i yeah the ones that don't work out is because it's because i did something really stupid you know i'm really glad you're publishing this because wow <laughs> this, this is nice to know <laughs> like Yeah, no, I, I really, really believe in this. This has just been like, how quickly can I get a really fantastic read? And that's because I, you know, I really became obsessed with um, speed, efficiency, and consistency yeah. when I was homeschooling my son. And I had like no time. <laughs> <laughs> and I really became obsessed with it. And so it's been, it's been nice to, um, I wish I had known about this when I was homeschooling. Now I, <laughs> but anyways, yeah. right okay i rely i gotta just I... sister crawford i've decided that i rely much too heavily huh? on the profiler or the the tip profiler i rely much too heavily on that great i'll take it out of the read making room no leave it there <laughs> it's fine all is okay well. So this is my next piece. It has no crow. Okay, it's got like barely two crows. All right. So there, there we hear that. So I'm going to go into the bottom of that anchor and take cane from there first. And this is a much narrower shape as compared to my Chris Leave shape. I did 16 there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I feel like it's more like 15, but that's okay. And so again, basically I've worked this area that's, it's in the channel, back of the tip um, in zone one. That's where I've just taken all that cane, okay? And I'm gonna crow this. 
That's three full crows. That's crazy. So I play it. Okay, no big surprise. It's completely thuddy. So we're going to go ahead and thin the entire blade left, right, and center with this large file, allowing the file to rotate off into the corners. So here's, and I'm going over the rails. So left side, and I allow the, the uh, file to rotate off the corner, right side, go off the corner, come right up the spine, but with lighter pressure, lighter pressure up the spine. I'm going to do that again. Left side, coming off the corner. Right side, coming off the corner. Up the spine, but with light pressure. Flip it over. Left side. Right side. Up the spine. Left side. Right side. Gently up the spine. Oh, I should have measured it. Shoot. Oh, well. <laughs> there, the crows are getting more complex. Wait a second. Annie, weren't you Nisea's teacher? My student. Nisea, do you see that Annie is here? Oh, my gosh. I can't believe I didn't connect this last week. Uh, I didn't I didn't want to embarrass her, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Nisea. <laughs> She's fine. She's fine. <laughs> hilarious okay good getting there but but if you have any tea to spill you know i'd love to hear it <laughs> i'm just kidding the say is wonderful <laughs> she hasn't been here long enough for for me to have any any complaints <laughs> There, there never are. She's, she's a peach. Okay, I'll stop embarrassing her now. <laughs> I wish I could see her right now. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. And... What, what'd you say, Riley? She is red. Ah. Okay, and I'm going to add in that little half moon that sits inside the anchor. It looks like that. Sister Crawford, I have a question for you. Sam. Okay, so every time not every time, oftentimes when I make a read, I will have towards the back of the read um, a definite spot where the spine, I don't know, it's really hard to see, but it's almost like part of the read dips inward on the back. Mm -hmm. You're getting a little divot, as I call them. Yeah. It's just because I think you, I think, um, and Riley, I think you do this too. I think you guys forget to go back and blend things. Like, I feel like you take oh, cane from before, specific areas. It's before I even take any cane off, it's there. Oh, so it's coming off the profiler. Is that what it, what it would be? If you haven't taken any cane off, but it's there, then it's coming, that's happening on the profiler machine. Are you using the Maxwell or are you using the reads and stuff or whatever it's called, reads, reads and things? Stuff. Reads and stuff. Okay. We might it, might, it might be time to do, it might be time to do an adjustment to it if we're getting a little divot there. Okay, so I've taken cane from the little half moons. And now I'm gonna go back to the bottom of the anchor. Starting there, I'm gonna blend. Ooh, who, that one, that was a decent crow. Was that you, Tara? Oh, sorry, I thought it was. And blend right into that. It's okay. So I'm going to blend from the bottom of the anchor up through the half moons right off the tip, avoiding the very center of the tip, avoiding the heart.
good. I really wish I had. And here's the aperture. I don't know if you guys remember what this looked like, but it's coming in really balanced. That aperture is, it's really great. The way the cane comes off, um, it, it creates a nice balanced tip. So it collapses evenly through the whole aperture. That looks great. <laughs> but it still feels tight. So um, without even playing it on my bassoon, I'm going to go ahead and come back to my large file and just thin the whole blade, just blending everything. I go right over the rails. I'm going to do left side. And I'm going to circle off on the corner and the right side. I'm not going to do um, go up the spine. However, when I come to the tip, I kind of grab, I kind of end up going all the way across the blade both times. So I come up and then I kind of grab the whole tip and rotate off. But I'm avoiding the spine all through here. I'm, this is barely getting touched by the file. And I'm gonna sandpaper it just because, I don't know, I just feel like that's what has to happen right now. <laughs> just because of how the cane's coming off. Okay. Ooh, I like that sound. There we go. Sounds like the third crow is a bit tight. But let's play it. This, uh, this is a very narrow shape. So of course it really lends itself to a very focused kind of brighter sound. So I'll check, check my open F and it's a bit on the low side. So I've probably hit the limit at the front of the reed. That's the low D it responds, but it's very sharp. And that makes sense because I feel like that third crow is very tight which of course means the back third or zone three of the reed is probably a bit heavy. I don't know if that comes through in the zoom, but that was very soft. So I, let me, let me see how heavy it is in the back of the reed. Yeah, I'm at one, I'm about 135 at the collar. So that's a bit heavy. And that's accurate with what I'm hearing. But I feel like the tip is basically right where I want it to be. So I'll take that big file. And I'll reverse my pressure. So I'll use a lot of pressure in the back, but I'm going to blend all the way off the tip. I feel like that's always important. So lots of pressure in the back and then just really light as I come off the tip. Lots of pressure in the back and then just slide right off the tip of the reed. Essentially no cane's gonna come off the front. And now I'm gonna just go straight across the back. but you always wanna keep blending forward so that you don't create any flat spots or divots because that kills vibration. The best way to have consistent vibration is an even taper with no flat spots, no divots. So we always wanna blend, blend off the reed. There we go. There's that kind of wild third crow. There it is. Oh, <laughs> 
Do you guys hear the difference when I play loud and soft over Zoom? Or does it just all sound the same? Yeah, I, I can hear a difference. You can hear? Okay, good. I've been messing around with like, well, anyways, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's got everything. Um, yeah, that's done. Probably the only thing, you know, tomorrow if I pull this readout, if I did anything, I'd, I, I would probably just, again, sandpaper the entire blade just to help because it's always going to be a little bit harder the next few days after that first day scrape. Um, yeah, so probably just sandpapering the entire blade. But otherwise, all of the elements are there. Um, again, it's a, it's a much narrower shape than my chrysalis, so it's got a lot more sizzle to it. I like the kind of uh, darker, nuttier sound of this, but this has a lot of nut. It also has a lot of sizzle. But there you go. There's two very, very different reeds finished using the exact same um, technique. And so that's the other thing I love about this system is that no matter what your gouge shape or profile is, I really think the two wire method helps the reed become the best version of itself, no matter what they are. I have done like every shape. I mean, so many shapes and so many profiles and uh, they all finish great. They all finish to be the best version of themselves. Yeah. What are your questions? I have a question if you don't mind my asking. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about the different crows and and which zone you associate the scraping with, um, do the do the hike if the third zone or the back of the reed is too heavy, is that the low crow or the highest crow from crowing the That's reed? That's the lowest crow or the third crow that comes in. So, so the first, your top crow is zone one. And this has always been the case for me with crows. Um, and then the second crow is the middle of the reed. And then that third crow, or the lowest crow, the octave crow is the back third of the reed, zone three. Yeah. Those are great crows. <laughs> I'm always, I'm, I, I'm gen. Every time I finish a read in this method, I'm always just like tickled pink at myself. Like not really at myself, but just that it works. Every time it finishes, and I'm like, wow, it's done. It, it just kind of amazes me again, because it would take me so much longer in, in, th in my three wire system of making reads, like, just so much longer and so much more room for error and much more complicated in my opinion. So Jordan, how are you doing over there? How's it going in Canada? It's going pretty good. Yeah. Is that really, that was really fast today or was it, did you stay up with me? I was able, I was able to stay up. That was actually pretty good. Good. And remember all this stuff is on my website and then also there's YouTube videos for all this as well. And I'll upload this today's um, class as well. But it's all there and everyone, of course, can always just email me with questions.